great to see everyone this afternoon. There's a few items that uh, I would like for you to keep on your radar over the next couple of months. Um, staff will be conducting member orientation on Wednesday, January the 19th from 1 to 2.30 p.m. at this location. And this is for all new committee and governing board members and existing members that would just like to uh, you know, uh, learn more, dig a little deeper into transportation planning, or you know, just to get a refresher for the TPO's role. So registration will be forthcoming and attendance is highly encouraged. The TPO's transportation subcommittee, which of course is comprised of your planners, engineers, public work staff, will be meeting to discuss the kickoff of our annual call for projects, also on January 19th, same day at 9 a.m. Um, and as you know, we have a new five-year federal reauthorization bill. And of course, this is our bread and butter, so to speak. And so at the meeting, we'll be kind of diving in, discussing the bill in terms of opportunities for upcoming um, discretionary grants. There's a lot of money coming to Florida, um, but there's still much to be developed over the coming months. So we want to get the subcommittee together um, and, and, you know, kind of be more strategic uh, in our conversations, talking about the projects that we want to apply for, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, because we really do need, need to be on the same page for some of these grants. Um, I did uh, speak to Mark Riker. He is the executive director of the NPOAC. That's our statewide NPO. Um, and he is closely, he has assured me that he is closely connected to the Office of Policy Planning, uh, as, well as, as well as Federal Highway. And um, as soon as he knows more concerning all this funding and how it is going to come down you know, to the DOT, perhaps the NPOs, to the local governments, he will let us know. So there's just a lot of unknowns right now and um, more to come. On February the 3rd, um, FDOT and the TPA will be hosting a Vision Zero Safe System Symposium. And this is part of our Vision Zero Action Plan. This was actually a recommendation. Um, this will be a full day event for transportation professionals and any TPO members uh, that would like to attend. And there is a brochure on page three of your package with more information and registration on that will be forthcoming. We do have a save the date for you as well. Uh, we are planning a governing board strategic plan workshop on April the 7th, and it's going to be from 11.30 to 4.30. Uh, we will have a professional facilitator help us update our strategic plan. Um, you know, this will also provide networking and team building for our governing board members and help provide policy direction for staff for the next three years. And so we want it to be fun and productive, uh, so it will be held at the Lord Zoo uh, at the Niagara River Lodge. Um, we will uh, have it catered uh, for lunch and uh, perhaps maybe a cash bar at the uh, end of the day uh, to make it even more fun. Um, and so we're really looking forward to that, so we just want you to save the day. There will be more information to come as well. And lastly, Abby has provided our public outreach and engagement report in their package. The last few months uh, have been extremely busy. But I would like Abby to just quickly come up. Um, Abby's our public involvement officer and give a quick update on our new website, which we are extremely proud of and have gotten a lot of uh, accolades and a lot of attention. Thank you, Georgiana. Um, as for Madam Jeanette Abbott Hemingway, I'm the Public Involvement Officer for the Space Coast CPO, and hopefully by now you have seen our new redesigned website. This has been a year in the making. Um, we're really excited about it. It's very uh, simplified, not only for our members and um, for our partners, but really this is for the general public. This is for them to get to know literally who we are, what we do, and how they can get involved, and also about our boards and committees. For you, what is most important is most likely our agenda center. That's where you'll find your agendas for meetings like today. They are all now housed in one portal called the Agenda Center. Uh, they are broken down into different committees and boards, and everything is right there for you, uh, including the meeting video once it's uploaded. So we're very excited about this new website where it's going to continue to be streamlined, um, and there are really great new features like 
uh, personal customization uh, for different abilities. It's mobile optimized, so very excited about it. And uh, if you haven't seen it, please make sure you check it out. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. I don't, that's it. Okay, all right. The um, Technical and Citizens Advisory Committee report, Georgiana? Yes, uh, the Technical and Citizens Advisory Committee met on Monday, and at your place, you do have a summary of actions and attendance from the meeting. The committees held their annual election of officers. They received presentations from FDOT and the Turnpike Enterprise. Um, they received the Brightline update, as well as the VR Company Master Plan update. And the committees do recommend that the TPO Governing Board approve the consent agenda and the TIP amendment for fiscal year 22 through 26. That is the report, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. Next report, uh, Bicycle, Pedestrian, and Trails, Sarah Crum. All right, good afternoon. I'm Sarah Crum. I'm the Senior Transportation Planner with the Space Coast TPO. The Bicycle Pedestrian Trails Advisory Committee met on October 25th. They recommended the approval of the U.S. Bike Route 1 realignment, which is under consent today for you. Um, they received the North Florida Trails Wayfinding Amenities Master Plan presentation, as well as also the State of the System presentation. The December BPAC meeting has been canceled um, due to lack of actionable agenda items. So we will not meet again until January 31st. I've also provided a year two progress report on our bicycle pedestrian master plan within your agenda package. So you can track some of the progress that we've made since adopting our bicycle pedestrian master plan two years ago. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Transportation Disadvantaged Local Coordinating Board. Terry Jordan. I not see Terry Jordan. He's coming up. Oh, he's behind me. Love Nora couldn't see him. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Terry George, Space of Terry Transit. Uh, action items that were taken on the local coordinating board this uh, month on the November 29th meeting were approval of the bylaws of the local coordinating board, the annual I'm sorry, annual approval of the grievance procedures, the annual operations report was uh, given by our finance officer and uh, was uh, voted on unanimously for the uh, year's activity. And the last item that was of um, actionable was the approval of the 2022 meeting calendar. Um, staff also gave uh, reports for the board members for the community transportation coordinators report, the transportation disadvantage planning grant report, and the transit services performance report card. And those are the items from this month's meeting. Thank you, Terry. Thank you very much. All right, we'll move on now to um, um, item E, FDOT report, Tyler Bridget. Good afternoon, Anna Taylor, FDOT. Uh, we're here today to present the work program, so we will defer our report um, in order for that presentation. Thank you. Can I have your presentation for you? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Um, the, the consent, consent agenda. agenda. Georgiana, would you please read through the, the consent agenda? Yes. The consent agenda uh, can be passed in one motion. Um, it is the approval of the governing board minutes of October 14th, approval of committee appointments, approval of resolution 22-10, which is the U.S. Bike Route 1 realignment, Approval of the award of the request for proposal auditing services agreement to James Moore and Company, and approval of our 2022 meeting calendar. Madam Chair, um, if you're willing to entertain a motion to approve that, I'm happy to make that motion, but I'm also comfortable if, if folks here are okay as well, moving to approve all the items identified, and then also item 5B is in Bravo, uh, which include the two revised uh, letters to our, our uh, congressman. Second. All right, we have a motion by um, Commissioner Loper and a second by the committee. Is that you? No. No. Mr. No. Allender. No. Thank you. I knew it came in that direction. <laughs> Thank you. I think it was too. All right, thank you. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And those opposed? All right, thank you very much. Motion carries. Um, 
All right, we'll move on to the uh, annual election of the officers and Mr. Gogelman. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and work through this. For those of you who wanna follow, it's on uh, page 98 of the agenda package. Uh, and the first provision, position to talk about is the position of chair. Uh, uh, Ms. Young, would you be interested in serving if, if re-elected? Absolutely, I've had a year to practice now, so <laughs> I'd like to get it right every meeting. Practice makes perfect, all right. Uh, we're open for nominations. Nominations under Robert's rules do not take a, take a second. I'm going to young again. Okay, Commissioner Lober nominates Ms. Young. Are there any Thank other you. nominations? Lober the nominations are closed. There a second to that motion? I will second. Okay, motion by Jordan, second by Lober to go ahead and close nominations and cast a unanimous ballot for uh, Ms. Young. Second. Dis discussion, seeing none. All those in favor signify by voting aye. 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 Opposed, the motion passes. Thank you. All right, the vice chair position is currently held by uh, council member Yvonne Minus. Ms. Minus, if re-elected, would you be interested in serving another, another term? Yes, sir, it's my pleasure. Okay. I'll go ahead and nominate Ms. Minus. Okay. Nomination by uh, Commissioner Lober for Ms. Minus. Are there any other nominations? Going once. Second. Motion by Jordan, second by Lober to close nominations. And cast a unanimous ballot for Ms. Minus. Thank you. All those in favor signify by voting aye. 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 Opposed? And the motion passes. I'll go ahead and nominate um, Mr. Jordan for secretary if I may. All right, uh, nomination Can by Commissioner Lover for, for, for Mr. Jordan. Robert Jordan. All right, any other nominations? Going once, twice, and three times. I'll accept a motion to close nominations and cast so a this ballot second. for Mr. Jordan. Uh, motion by Lover, second by Minus. Discussion seeing none. All those in favor signify by voting aye. 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 Opposed? And the motion passes. And uh, the assistant secretary's position is that of Georgiana Gillette. That does not uh, take a vote of this body to do that. It's pursuant to our bylaws. All right, now we move to the executive committee. And uh, the first position is the at-large at -large board member currently held by uh, Commissioner Allender. If, uh, if uh, re-elected, would you be interested in continuing to serve? Yes, sir. Okay. That's my motion. Or my nomination, excuse me. Okay, nomination by Lover for Commissioner Allender. Move that nomination to close. Second. Okay, motion by Jordan, second by Lover to close nominations and cast a unanimous ballot for Commissioner Lover. Discussion? Allender. 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 Don't do that to me. Allender. <laughs> Allender. Well, we'll get, we'll get Allender and we'll get Jordan correct, right? Yes. Uh, all right, seeing no discussion, all those in favor signify by voting aye. 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 Opposed, the motion passes. Next, next at lar large position is for that of uh, uh, Council Member Koss. Nominate Ms. Koss. Okay. Move that nomination to close. Second. Okay. Uh, nomination by Commissioner Lover for Ms. Koss. Uh, motion by Jordan, Jordan and Lover uh, to close nominations right. and cast a unanimous ballot for Ms. Koss. You're interested in serving free, free elected, I assume. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> that was kind of a draft, I think. It's like being yeah. in the Army. Uh, all right. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor, signify by voting aye. 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 And opposed? And the motion passes. We now move on to the uh, representative on the MPOAC that is currently uh, Council Member Young. Would you be interested in continuing to serve yes, in that I position? Would. Yes. Nomination. Okay. Uh, nomination by, by Lover. Any other nominations? Move that nomination to close. Second, second Lover. Uh, motion by Jordan, second by Lover to go ahead and close nominations and cast a unanimous ballot for, for Ms. Young. All those in favor signify by voting aye. Aye. Uh -huh. Opposed? And the motion passes. The alternate position is currently uh, held by uh, Commissioner Lover. So move. Oh, oh, hang, hang on. on. <laughs> I didn't hear who did. Hang on. You can't, no, you can't do that. Madam Chair, I, I'd just like to say if Mr. Wallace is interested, as he's new, I thought this might be a good opportunity for him. Uh, yes, I'll be interested. In so moved. For Mr. Wallace? Yes. I'll, I'll go ahead and second. Oh. So we don't have to okay, nom nomination, nomination by Commissioner Ollander. And uh, are there any other nominations? Both have nominations to close. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, motion, motion by Jordan, second by Lobert. 
to go ahead and close nominations and cast a unanimous ballot for Mr. Willis. Uh, all those in favor, signify by voting aye. 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 All those opposed, seeing none, congratulations, Mr. Willis. And we now move on to the Central Florida Alliance. Uh, Commissioner Pritchett, who is not here today, uh, would anybody like to nominate her or draft her? I'll go ahead and do it. Okay. I'll second that. All right. Not here. <laughs> yeah, why not? What else could we volunteer for? All right. <laughs> Commissioner, Commissioner Lover right. nominates uh, Commissioner Pritchett for the uh, representative on the Central Florida MPO Alliance. We'll have nomination for the post. Second. Okay. Motion by Jordan, second by Minus to go ahead and close nominations and cast unanimous ballot for Ms. Pritchett who has just been drafted. All those in favor? Aye. 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 By voting aye. All those opposed? Madam Chair. And Mr. Goodwin. I'm just thinking if we're going to go down the list for the rest of them, sure. we just make one motion to reappoint everyone who's listed in their respective positions and okay. do it all in one fell swoop. All right. That would include uh, all the representatives for the alliance, the alternates for the alliance, and I assume what you're doing is also including the transportation disadvantage local coordinating board. board designee as well? Yes, and just to, to recap for folks who may be watching uh, the uh, agenda available, it's all of the remaining items on page 98 of the agenda under item 5A's and alpha. Uh, so Young, Minus, Robinson, Foster, Williams, and Young. Okay, that's enough. That you just heard, the, uh, in this case, a motion by Commissioner Lover. Second. And there's a second by Commissioner uh, Council Member Minus. Move the nomination be closed. Second. Okay, a motion by Jordan, second by Allender to go ahead and close nominations. Uh, and uh, I guess we're passing, uh, we're passing the, passing the uh, motion by Lover. All those in favor signify by voting aye. 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 Opposed, and the motion passes. We're Thank you. Hard, we? I'm, returning the, I'm returning the gavel. <laughs> All right, well that was easy. All right, um, 5B, Mr. Uh, Commissioner Lober put this item in with the uh, consent. All right, so we are finished with that. We'll move on to C, which is a resolution for the TIP amendment for Dan, and this will be a roll call vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, FDOT has requested several amendments to our current transportation improvement program. Uh, and for your reference, uh, they are all listed on uh, page uh, 116 of your package. Um, and there are nine projects that I will run through very quickly. And that is the, the first two projects is the NASA Parkway West and the Kennedy Parkway. Uh, these are for planning studies in fiscal year 22. Um, and the studies will report and determine design and maintenance needs. Uh, and if you remember, jurisdiction uh, respo and responsibility will be transferred from NASA to the DOT. And this was really kind of uh, part of the infrastructure grant for the replacement of the bridge and the widening of Space Commerce Way. We also have three um, ITS projects, Intelligent Transportation System, Malabar Road, San Felipe Drive, and Emerson Drive, they're all City of Palm Bay projects funded with the TPO's uh, federal funding, and it's for a design phase in fiscal year 22. We also have the Clear Lake Road uh, safety project from State Road 520 to 528. This is a federal stimulus project. Um, it was a resurfacing project of the department. Uh, this corridor has had a high crash rate uh, for quite a few years. Uh, and it has been looked at for the various safety improvements. So this is a safety project. Design is in 22 and construction is in 23. And then we have three State Road A1A sidewalk projects. Um, and they're for design and fiscal year 22. Uh, the TPO has, is continually trying to fill in sidewalk gaps along A1A. And so it's for design for three of these projects. So that is the tip amendment and we are re requesting approval. Uh, amending the fiscal year 22 through 26 tip. So moved. Second, Lover. I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, you referenced attachment E. Where is it? Let's see. Attachment A. Yeah, attachment A. So uh, right behind the resolution is the DOT's letter. Right. And I see that uh, we should probably put attachment A of 
had a motion. We have the second. This is a roll call vote. Allender? Yes. Felix? Yes. Forrester? Yes. Foster? Yes. Jordan? Yes. Hawk? Yes. Lober? Yes. Robinson? Yes. Smith? Yes. Willis? Yes. Young? Yes. Who did I miss? Minus. We appreciate your patience. Um, uh, our board services uh, administrator uh, accepted another position. And Laura, thankfully, is filling filling in temporarily. But we do have that position advertised. So thank you for your patience. <laughs> okay, we'll move on. But I did want to say thank you to EDDOT for all the work that they've done for the funding they have they've put in place. And that we are certainly looking forward to additional grant funding that will may be available. I just wanted to put that out there. Next item, um, presentations. <coughs> I think the first one will be from that. Dot. Five. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Board Members. Um, Kathy Alexander, Program Management Administrator at District 5. And thank you for the opportunity to be here today to present on the tentative work program. So what is the tentative work program? Um, the tentative work program represents the transportation projects that we have programmed in the upcoming five years. This represents projects in transportation, um, in biped, roadways, airport, pedestrian, trails, bus, transit, any of the sort. Um, and it includes transportation planning, transportation systems management and operations, engineering and design, right-of-way acquisition, construction activities, and anything else that would support any of the delivery of those projects in the upcoming five years. While FDOT is not the lead agency for aviation seaport space border transfer projects, these type of projects are represented within the plan as we administer some of those grant programs. So what happens each year is each district compiles their district needs, their priorities. Um, we also collaborate and work in tandem with our local partners, as well as stakeholders, as well as the MPOs and the PO, and MPOs and TPOs. We gather all of the priority lists, all of the regional needs, and we develop a tentative work program, everything that we intend to deliver in the upcoming five years. Um, each district does that. Ultimately, each district's tentative work program is then combined to develop the statewide tentative work program that is submitted to um, Tallahassee, and it goes through the governor, it goes to legislature review, um, and it goes through review, approval, and ultimately adoption in the following year. Mm -hmm. um, we manage the work program in terms of fiscal years. The fiscal year runs from July 1st until June 30th of the following year. So in this, year, this cycle, we're representing fiscal years 23 through 27. That first fiscal year is fiscal year 23. That will begin July 1st of 22 and end June 30th of 23. This slide gives you information on how we develop the process of getting to an adopted work program. What you see right now is the adopted work program for fiscal year 22 through 26. That was formally adopted July 1st of this year. Um, the first year is also known as lockdown, and it's set that way for budgetary purposes. So if there's any changes to that first year, we have to go through Tallahassee for administrative approval. So not only does July 1st kick off the adopted work program, it's also where we embark upon developing or programming the tentative work program. What happens is that first year projects fall off. All the years shift over to the left, and the new fifth year gets added in the back end. So now we have the next cycle, the upcoming five years, 23 through 27. Um, this is a very extensive process. It really don't begin July 1st. We begin the way before that, gathering all the information for the district as well as our local partners, MPOs and TPOs. But it's really where we start programming and balancing the, pro the tentative work program and making sure that we are balancing that against available financial funding resources as well as meeting program areas and targets that were required to meet for the state transportation system. Um, 
All right, here gives you kind of the steps of the, um, the activities that take us from tentative to adopted. I mentioned we begin July 1st, so that's also where we, excuse me, where we receive the priority project list from our MPO CPO partners. Um, we go through the summer of compiling all the information and all the needs to start to develop the plan. Uh, one key activity that happens in the summer, or early fall, is the Florida Revenue Estimating Conference. The reason why that is so important is because as a result of that conference is where we receive the projected revenues as well as the allocations that are going to be able to support the tentative work program. Um, it is also there where we, we receive the allocations for some of the requirements for the program areas like I mentioned. That could include our preservation such as uh, resurfacing lane mile targets as well as our structures maintenance, um, uh, rehab and repairs and replacements. So that information is used to develop um, the snapshot, which is a snapshot is basically our balanced plan that we're proposing. Uh, we held a work program public hearing the last week of October. It was a virtual public hearing. There was a two-week period for public comment on that. And then there was an additional due date for the MPOs and TPOs to submit any objections they may have to the tentative work program. Right now, our tentative work program is under review by the Secretary of Transportation. Um, ultimately, this will all be combined and will be submitted to um, the governor for review. It'll also go to the Florida Transportation Commission for a formal review of the statewide, just to make sure that we're you know, in compliance with some of the state priorities as well. And then it'll go through the review of the legislature. The Le session begins January 11th, and it runs through March, uh, yeah, March 11th. Um, and then ultimately, it'll make it to the governor for his formal approval, and then adoption July 1st. Um, all of these reviews entail uh, maybe financial compliance, administrative checks, just to make sure everything is right. And you can tell it's a long period. We're talking about a year of putting this together. So it is subject to change at any time until it is adopted the following year. All right, if we look at what we have represented in terms of dollars for Brevard County within the upcoming tentative, um, five-year plan. We have a, t uh, a $969 million, slightly over that, that is represented across various type projects in fiscal years 23 through 27. If we break that down a little bit further for types of projects, what you see here, safety, this would be um, roadway safety projects, turn lanes, lighting. Um, we have $13.5 million represented in the work program for that. Capacity, these would be your added lanes, um, a little bit over $83 million. Preservation, this would be like I mentioned, the resurfacing and the structures and the maintenance of our assets. Um, we have over um, close to $231 million in the upcoming five years. Multimodal includes aviation, space, transit, seaport, and the funding that we have allocated for that in the upcoming five years, close to $539 million. Um, operations, this would be kind of like your traffic signals, um, signal upgrades, intelligent transportation systems. The total for that amount um, you see there is close to $12 million. And then we have bike and ped, this would be your sidewalk and trails inclusive in that, in that category, close to $24 million. And then there's miscellaneous, this is basically not everything else that falls out of those major categories, maintenance, drainage, landscaping studies. We also have a rest area project represented in the work program. Question for you, on the, the bike ad where it says 24 million roughly, is that for both uh, reworking existing bike and pedestrian facilities or is that just new construction? Yes, it would be, it could be um, repairs of current ones, upgrading current ones, anything that's related to bike Thank and you. trails. Yep. And then what you see here to the right is we have a total of 12 priority projects from, that are represented by space codes that are represented in the tentative work program with a total dollar value of over $94 million. And does, does the $94 million, is that represented within the individual categories on the left-hand column? Correct. Yep. Thank you. All right. I'm going to highlight a few projects. Um, there's lots in the work program. It'll take a while to go through everything, so we'll just hit on some key major ones. Um, Ellis Road Lighting, that I know this is a significant project for the region. We do have funding allocated for right-of-way and construction in the tentative five years. Um, we have right-of-way in fiscal years 23 to 26, and construction right now is parked in 26. 
um, total funding that we have there is close to $37 million for those spaces. Oh, thank you. Um, a couple more capacity projects. This is, uh, both of these represent State Road 528 different segments. Um, on the left hand side, you see 407 3 We have right away funded in that in the upcoming five years, years 24 through 27, about $10 million. And on the right hand side, it's the eastern region of the project. And here we have environmental support as well as right away activities funded in the upcoming five years, 24 through 27, for close to $3 million. Another capacity project, this one is along State Road A1A. And here we have right of way funded as well as rail, railroad, utilities, and construction. Right of way is funded in the first year of the tentative fiscal year 23, and the remaining activities are funded in 26. Total amount for that is a little over $9, $9 million. An operational improvement, this would be the traffic management center is also um, included in our tentative work program. Here we have construction funded in fiscal year 24 for $9.5 million. Talking about back bike path and trails, um, here you see a couple projects, both Space Coast Trail on the left hand side we have environmental support and construction uh, for the Space Coast Trail from Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge to west of Kennedy Parkway. And that our environmental activity is occurring in 23, which is the first year of the upcoming tentative, and then construction is in 27, the last year, um, close to $11.5 million. And then another portion on that, another segment of the same Space Coast Trail, the construction on that one is funded in fiscal year 27 at this time for $3.6 million. We did have one project that advanced. This means that it came into the, it, it moved up in the upcoming five years. This was 433655-1. It's an ad term lanes project, uh, US 192 and Hollywood Boulevard. The construction advanced on that project by one year from 24 to 23 at the request of the TPO. We had one deferral, um, I think this one was mentioned earlier, um, and this is a space commerce, wide, space commerce way widening, excuse me. And it was moved out one year just so that it can match up and they can realign the uh, schedule between that project and the NASA Parkway. And with that up close, I'll just make reference, if you haven't checked it out already, we do have this information out at our, on our website, which is the District 5 Work Program Public Hearing website. The documents are still there. You can view the information either through a GIS map or an actual report for the county. And with that, I'll go ahead and open up any questions you might have. Yes, Mr. Jordan. The, the first one is basically fiscal. When you have the tentative budget, I assume that you um, have inflation in that also? That's so far out. Yeah, that is taken into account into the SMS to the projects that are represented in the report. Okay, and the second one, the last one, is actually about the space commerce park, and you see trying to align that with the bridge. Why is that? Are, are they going to be the same contractors to do it? Or? That was based on the infra grant agreement, the way it was written up. Um, it was an administrative request. I don't have the specifics as to why. I just know that they were trying to line up based on that infra, that infra grant agreement. I don't know if my counterparts from FDOT would have anything else to feed on it or anybody. Anna? I don't, I don't think it's the bridge. I think it's the NASA, uh, the other research team. There were two resurfacing projects in, in the infra grant along with the bridge. But like I said, if you give me those details. Okay. Are they just so far away from each other? I'm just wondering why. Yeah, it was part of, they were trying to do, it's the NASA bridge replacement. It's definitely tied to it. Um, I went back and checked my notes, actually. I was trying to be prepared before I came. I just, you caught me off guard for a second. But yeah, no, it is the NASA. It's the project schedule update with the NASA Causeway bridge replacement, and it was based on the agreement on lining up those schedules. But we can get more specifics as to why. Okay. Thank you. I would mention, Madam Chair, if I may, uh, sometimes when a project is deferred, it could just uh, be a matter of a few months, but yet it would trigger 
the change of a fiscal year. So aligning those schedules, you know, with uh, with the resurfacing of, from the bridge all the way to Space Commerce Way, and the widening of Space Commerce Way, and then the resurfacing of the Kennedy Parkway, uh, which you know was on NASA property, uh, and now the department is going to be taking that over. So there's a lot going on there. So it's probably not. It could not even. It may not even be a full year, but it could yeah. be just a matter of months. But yeah, yeah. that's a good point because it could be a matter of 24 hours. <laughs> June 30th to July 1st, but you can't encumber it in 24 hours. So, yeah. I have a couple of questions. The um, um, the bike trails on North Grand Island. Um, we had several discussions a few years back about those as to where how they would. I guess my real question right now is. Is this, this is going into the design or actual construction? These are actually, these are the ones that you're referring to, the Space Coast Trail? Right. Yeah, these actually you have environmental support, which would be the environmental in, in investigation or certification or documentation that they need in order they can enter into construction. And it's actual construction that is, is, is represented in the tentative. Okay, because we had, uh, as part of our earlier discussions, had talked about the advantages of you know, widening the existing lane to allow for bicycles to actually building a bike path. Uh, you recall it, you know, that you're building an actual bike path parallel to the road. And I was wondering if anybody had any idea of what was happening on that. Sarah attends the design meetings. She's at every single one of them, and she's probably the best person to, okay. to go into a little bit I'm of sorry, detail. Sorry, I'm picking one of the wrong okay. <laughs> So um, through basically the design project and the pd &E, they have been able to make it where the bike path is completely off-road, not part of the road. Um, it will go through basically um, the abandoned railroad um, along the Canaveral National Seashore section. And then it does come back where it's like, I think a four foot buffer from the road, but it is a separated facility. Perfect. Thank you. So, yeah. Good job. Uh, my other question is on the five, east end of the 528. Um, that's going into where are we we're going into. We've got some right away funding. Uh, that's another section where we had a lot of conversations about as to how that. In fact, we had a lot of some studies done and the whole thing uh, about how that was going to. If there was a way to open that up to allow more water flow through there in order to help improve the quality of the lagoon water. And I'm just wondering what became of those things that we talked about again several years ago. Still ongoing, um, but I think that we are getting very close to uh, a resolution. You know, why 528 is a priority um, uh, in the stimulus? on how much money can come into the district. I can see that project probably moving forward in the design build. But you know, we wanted the design needed to be updated to lengthen the bridge, elevate the bridge um, over the Banana, Banana River. And so uh, we have a meeting uh, coming up where we're gonna have a little bit more conversation about that. But I think we're getting to the point where we're gonna come to a resolution on that and perhaps resiliency is going to be the key. Maybe great job, part of the cause. But, uh, but I'm, I'm going to wait until we have a, an, a, an official meeting and we can kind of talk about it in more detail, but I think we are, we're close, I think. Okay, and, and I have one more just general question. I'm not sure if anybody in the room has a clue on this yet, but do we have any indications of what the process or how much funding is going to come from this new federal infrastructure policy? We know how much Florida is going to be getting. We do not know the rest of the details. Um, and it's very all. frustrating. I know uh, uh, Mark Bernath, he, or the county, uh, the, uh, the municipalities, we're all waiting, anxiously awaiting. The department uh, does not know uh, really what's going on. Um, you know, a lot of this is going to be have, to have to be worked out on the federal level. Um, but definitely, we, we are really hoping that some of our priorities forward on our priority list. Um, 
So we will we will let everyone know as soon as possible. And then the transportation subcommittee will be meeting the first part of January. And um, again, that's the planners, the engineers, public works directors. We uh, hopefully we'll have more information and we can talk about it as a group uh, and and know how to move forward uh, for Brevard County. Like I said, it's more information than I expected you to have. <laughs> Yeah, and we haven't heard anything. We basically everything that's been shared with the public is what the DOT is aware of, and it's just a matter of we know what's coming to Florida, but we just don't know how that's going to be distributed in any way. Uh, and if I may say one thing, um, you know, my predecessor used to say uh, this is probably one of the most important things we do. That's our project priorities, and and turn that priority list over to the DOT, and they fund as many of these projects with available state and federal funding, and so. Uh, to get our number one and our number two priority. Thank you, Commissioner Smith, for um, the, the county provided a match for the widening of Ellis, as well as the Traffic Management Center, Commissioner Loeber, who uh, uh, voted to move that number two on our priority list, which is extremely important to the department. The higher the priority, the better off you're gonna be. Uh, but in my conversation with Secretary <coughs> Purdue, this funding has gotten so competitive so many people wanting it. There's so many projects out there. The way that Florida is growing, uh, the way Brevard County is growing, all of Central Florida. So coming to the table with money is what gets your foot in the door. And we got our number one and our number two project funded. So thank you to the, our county commissioners. And now we can move on to number three and number four. We've got Malabar and, and South Babcock, but we also have the widening of 528, our CIS priorities. 401 bridge replacement. We've got some big projects that, that, that we've got to, to really jump on. And so we're hoping that this infrastructure bill, this is a one-time shot, that we can get as much as we can here in Brevard County. So thank you, uh, Catherine, um, and the secretary, um, and, and all the other DOT folks over here. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you for question. Okay, we, we can go back to our uh, priority one, the TPO tier eight, program one uh, with the um, St. John's Heritage Parkway and Ellis Road. Uh, the signage there um, on I-95, I think that's exit 182. Um, if we can include or entertain, I've um, noticed several other um, exits on 95. Um, they have um, 90, uh, Wicken Road, or it may have Piney the Causeway, or it may have Fisk Boulevard. The two exits off of, uh, well, this particular exit, um, 182, does not, it says West Miller. Uh, we have two West Miller exits. If we can entertain or, or um, have that <coughs> added. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, that is Ellis Road. So if we can include Ellis Road on that, I oh, would appreciate that. Um, several times I've gotten off of that exit, I think I'm in West Melbourne, I am in West Melbourne, but the 192 exit, okay? So if we can include uh, Ellis Road on that as we do with the other exits like this Boulevard or Wooden Road or, you know, the other, that would be great. Noted, we'll take, we'll take the comment. We'll take the comment back and then see if there's any possibility. Obviously, we're going to take some more coordination and collaboration with that, but we definitely no note it. And That's we'll take it back as a comment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Minus. I thought that was an excellent idea. Any other comments on this particular presentation? Don't see any. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Alexander. Thank you. All right. Next presentation is um, Brightline. Um, Katie Mitzer. Doesn't look like Katie Mitzer. Brightline. Real world update. Sorry. I'm sorry, I'm out of order. Turnpike. Thank you. board members. My name is CIC Fine and I am the MPO liaison for the Florida Stormpike Enterprise. 
Uh, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to present the Turnpike Tenure Board Program for fiscal years 2023 through fiscal years 2027. In Brevard County, the Turnpike is proposing to fund $24.4 million in major projects. Included in your agendas is the work program summary. So this is a blue document. Looks something like this. And this document highlights the Turnpike's major projects, minor projects, current construction projects, and upcoming pd and &E and design efforts for all of FDOT District 5. Florida's turnpike system consists of limited access facilities and provides Florida's residents and visitors with a safe, efficient, and affordable means of travel. Turnpike facilities are located in six FDOT districts and 19 counties. In Brevard County, we have the Beachline Expressway East. The Turnpike's mission is to help meet the state's growing transportation needs, ensuring value to customers, protecting investors, and managing the Turnpike system in a business-like manner. With that mission in mind, the project I will discuss today supports the Department of Transportation's vital few core areas, which are improving safety, enhancing mobility, and inspiring innovation. The slide, this slide illustrates how the Florida's Turnpike receives revenues and processes expenditures. Revenue is collected through user tolls and concessions at our service clauses. We do not receive any revenue from gas taxes or any other taxes. According to our bond covenants, the Turnpike must first pay for operations and maintenance costs. These include the cost to collect and process toll payments. Then we must pay out the debt on the bonds issued to construct major projects. It should be noted that due to our high credit rating, the Turnpike has historically benefited from some of the lowest borrowing costs in the toll industry. After that, we invest revenue into renewal and replacement, such as resurfacing projects or other reoccurring improvement costs. Finally, the Turnpike uses the remaining funds to pay for capital improvements, such as widening and interchange improvements. The Turnpike has various ways of determining how projects get funded depending on the project type. All our projects must demonstrate a transportation need and are prioritized accordingly. Widening and interchange projects are ranked in priority through an annual effort that looks at observed traffic data and future projections across the entire system. Expansion projects must meet environmental and economic feasibility as part of the prioritization process. <laughs> Of course, stakeholder input is very important and is considered throughout the project development process. With that being said, there is one major project in Brevard County uh, program in the Turnpike Center Work Program, and it is Project 442-876-1, uh, which is a newly added ITS or Intelligent Transportation Systems Improvement Project on the Beachline Expressway East with construction funds in fiscal year 2024. The proposed improvements consist of replacing the existing Intelligent Transportation System or ICS along the Beachline Expressway East. Um, from State Road 520 to Industry Road, uh, slash Clear Lake Road, slash State Road 524. Um, also included is a new roadway lighting system that will also be installed at Industry Road, Clear Lake Road, State Road 524 interchange. The project spans both Orange and Brevard counties and includes installation of fiber optic backbone, conduit, pool boxes, splice bolts, cabinets, switches, microwave detection systems, dynamic message signs, uh, roadway weather systems, and closed caption television, closed circuit television. For more information on all projects in the Turnpike's Tentative Work Program, you can visit the FDOT Work Program Public Hearing website and download the FDOT District 5 Public Hearing Report. Turnpike projects in Brevard County can be found in this document. Thank you again, and if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them now. Yes, Ms. Claus. Um, you, mentioned, you mentioned the lighting system mm -hmm. on Clear Light at 524. 
What, what exactly is that new light system that you refer to? Uh, I would have to give you more information on that. Um, it's, uh, my notes are just general a new lighting system. Is it system. just at that intersection? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Mr. Lebeau. At the at the risk of being a little repetitive, I, I know that I've said this to other FDOT employees, um, I believe even the TPO meetings in the past, but I, I just want to be consistent in making sure that anytime we talk about public hearings or public meetings, that I get this out there. Um, a lot of constituents of mine, and I've got probably in D2 maybe 120,000 or so constituents, um, a lot of them like having the ability to make public comment on specific projects. So I would just ask to the degree that, that you have items that come up where it may be a public hearing or a public meeting, if you can incorporate a reasonable amount of time for folks to be able to say their piece for three or four minutes, I, I think it would be tremendously appreciated by a lot. Yeah, and, and, and we do. Um, so this project information was also provided at the FDOT District 5 um, public hearing that they had for the work program. But, uh, Kind of work program. Do you know if they accepted public comment during that process? Because I know sometimes it's more informational where FDOT comes and they present, and there's value to that, there's no doubt. Um, but I think over and above that, especially for something that's upcoming, uh, where there's some ability to, to alter the plans if there's input that's received that really does make FDOT rethink whether the, uh, the proposed path forward is the best path, I think allowing for that public comment is a value. And I believe they, that they did, Anna? Yeah, we had a two-week public comment period. It's very typical that the Turnpike's uh, work program uh, is in line with our district work program. So uh, just like you would do it in District 1 or any others, uh, it's all combined. We did have a two-week uh, comment period, which I believe in Kathy's presentation she just gave you, kind of had that schedule of when we close to comment. Um, I, it wasn't a, it's not a formal, um, public hearing with a court reporter. I think that's kind of what you're alluding to where people can speak for two minutes. It was a written comment um, situation. There is a written comment option online as well with the comment form that you could fill out. And I, I think what I'm looking for is maybe, maybe a step between the two, but certainly closer to the latter. Um, I don't necessarily care if there's a court reporter unless there's some legal requirement to have a court reporter if they record it. If they take minutes in the alternative, if, if your legal counsel suggests that's sufficient, wonderful. But I, I think. Okay. Well, I, I, again, I'm, I'm not going to. Um, I'm not going to argue with you with respect to that. You may well be absolutely correct, or there may be some other alternate means of noticing it as a different style of hearing or as a different style of meeting that still allows for that public comment. But I, I think you know, as, as nice as it is to have a public comment period and to allow folks to submit comments by writing. I think there's an expectation, whether it's FDOT, whether it's the county commission, whether it's uh, TPO or otherwise, that if we're expending public funds, and this isn't a criticism toward you, it's just a suggestion moving forward truly. I, I have no issue with how you've done anything uh, in the times that I've dealt with you, but it's, it's more departmental. If, if you have the opportunity to allow folks to get up and, and say their piece for a few minutes, I think that's tremendously more valuable to the community than simply having an ability to send in cards. Because I'll, I'll tell you when it comes to either traffic circles or things of that nature, which is the most recent issue that I've had folks um, essentially jump on the bandwagon with, a lot of folks, and I'll, I'll put out there in, in full candor, myself included, went to Cape Canaveral. Um, I think I probably put 70 or 80 miles on my car doing it, if you look at the round trip between Vieira, where I was at the time, and Cape Canaveral, where I was going, um, and back again in order to make public comment, only to find out that there was a box to leave your comments. And I, I think, you know, in, in a way, it may actually do you all a better service, because if you find that, or if you have a constituent or constituents that think that their opinion is the majority opinion, and they find that it's not, I think there may be less folks upset at you when they hear that two-thirds are supportive of a particular plan, and that they're in the minority of being in, in a small handful that perhaps doesn't like it. So I, I think it, it does cut both ways where it could be good or it could be bad in terms of public support. But I, I think there's a value in it, especially when you're talking about these high value, high value, high dollar level projects. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or concerns? 
All right, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. It was a very good presentation. Thank you. I'd like to throw this to <laughs> All right, we'll move on to the next item, um, which now we're caught up. Now we're bright line. Okay, you miss it. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Good afternoon. Uh, Council members, chairwoman, commissioners, uh, very wonderful to be in front of you again. We've spent a lot of time in Brevard County this week. Uh, I want to uh, also acknowledge uh, Jordan Chandler and Kendall Moore are here. Um, also, um, as we get questions, if there are particular questions I cannot answer, um, they may be able to shed some light on it for you. So, um, so we're going to go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, um, with regards to um, the Brightline update, um, for any of you who have driven through Brevard County, especially along the State Road 528 and I-95, you know we have a lot going on. Um, and I see a lot of friendly faces in uh, the crowd here who have been out on site with us uh, for tours, um, getting uh, their feet dirty out there uh, in the dirt um, as we're showing the the various progress on our work. And so that's where I spend a lot of my time. Um, so you often see me in jeans, uh, searching from steel to a boost to heels. If anyone um, ever wants to come out and see our project, uh, whether it be at the railroad crossings that we're working on, the bridges, or the variety of projects that we have going along, going on along the beach line, please just reach out because we're always welcome uh, to provide you those tours. The Bright Line is here to challenge the status quo, and we just heard um, from our uh, partners at FDOT with regards to the additional work that's going to be taking place along the highways and roadways uh, throughout the county. Uh, we know we have um, uh, 900 to 1,000 people moving into the state of Florida every day, and so getting folks from one destination to the next is going to require multiple mobility options and modalities, and uh, Bright Line is here to offer um, another transportation option. We currently have our service in here in Florida, of course, down in South Florida. We did suspend service for COVID in 2020, but we have resumed service in South Florida. And I believe um, I've seen uh, over 30,000 um, folks who um, boarded the train in the last couple of weeks since we resumed service. And of course, um, part of what I'm gonna um, update you on today uh, is the Orlando Extension Project. Um, which is extending our service from South Florida, from West Palm Beach um, to Orlando International Airport. We also have our Brightline West project, uh, which will be connecting Las Vegas to Victorville, California with an all electric train. And uh, we're looking um, to begin work on that in the next year or so. Oops. So if we take a look at the numbers um, with uh, the congested markets and connecting those congested markets we certainly know that I-95 is um, kind of like that Main Street, uh, certainly through South Florida. And for any of us who are trying to get from uh, Central Florida to South Florida, uh, it is a very congested corridor. And so if we look there, the average miles per hour over the year, uh, just how they continue to go down as we add more and more vehicles to that roadway. And providing, um, connect, we're connecting city pairs that are what we call too close to fly and too far to drive. So when we look at Miami to Orlando and providing people additional options to be able to get to their destination. This is another, this shows the map there of the state of Florida. Of course, we're the third largest state in the US with 20 million residents and 130 million visitors. That was in 2019. Uh, we began our initial passenger operations in uh, 2018 from Miami to West Palm Beach with a stop in Fort Lauderdale. Um, and we believe that our complete system uh, will provide access to 70% of the state's residents. Our flagship stations, uh, Miami and then Orlando International, uh, will be those flagship stations. Our station, which I'll go into more detail about uh, in Orlando, will be located in the intermodal terminal facility, which is the South Terminal. If you've been to the airport and you see the new blue signs that say Terminal C, that's the same area, that's where our station is. We've worked in partnership with GOA, and when they built that um, building, they built it in line with our station. So we will begin actually building out that station next year, but that's where we will be located, right there in Terminal C. 
We also have our inline stations in West Palm Beach and Fort Lauderdale, and we are currently under construction for stations in Aventura, right near the Aventura Mall, and Boca Raton. Some of our major milestones, I already mentioned that we are back up in operation in South Florida. We recently hired on more than 200 new teammates. Uh, we also are looking to be on track to Orlando with substantial completion the end of next year. We're currently at 70% completion. We've worked 4.5 million man hours to date, and we have more than 1,300 workers on the job. The total construction cost, including both South Florida and phase two, our Orlando extension, is $4.5 billion. Some additional numbers I want to bring to your attention, $653 million in federal, state, and local government tax revenue. We've, we will, um, we've created more than 10,000 jobs throughout our rail line construction. Once operational to Orlando, we will have created, we'll be creating more than 2,000 additional jobs. We have a $6.4 billion direct economic impact to Florida's economy over the eight-year construction process and implementation. And I also want to mention, as we talk about from a sustainability standpoint, uh, 160,000 metric tons of CO2 are removed annually um, by our trains uh, carrying passengers. So to give you an idea, when we look at the gallons of gasoline used uh, to, to transport 500 people between Miami and Orlando, and we expect our initial trains um, that will be consist of four passenger, via, uh, passenger cars and two locomotives, and then initially the, the capacity will be around 260. But based on the capacity of 500, it will um, take just under 500 gallons of gas to transport those 500 people between Miami and Orlando. By car, that same trip for 500 people, over 1,300 gallons, and by, I'm sorry, by plane, over 1,300 gallons, and by car, over 3,000 gallons. Something else we'll, uh, I want to touch on, we have integrated what we call first mile, last mile options and possibilities, which when you're getting to the station and you arrive at your station, which is how do you get to your final destination? The office you're going to, the museum you're going to, perhaps the entertainment venue. And so one of the things that we um, just launched uh, in the last uh, two weeks, actually, was called Brightline Plus, and I have a graphic, I'll be able to show you a little bit more about that. But it's about providing people that option right in our app as you book your ticket, so that when you get to our station, your station destination, you can go ahead and book that trip, and perhaps it's with an electric vehicle, or it's a ride-sharing opportunity to be able to get you to your um, final destination, all within uh, that one seamless um, app. And so this is what uh, uh, Brightline Plus looks like. Uh, you can see uh, our app on the far right side. When you book your ticket with Brightline, you do so on the app, you have an online profile, so we have a complete manifest of everyone who's on our trains, which is a, uh, certainly a safety, uh, a safety measure. Uh, and then when you uh, are booking, if you um, want to go ahead and book something on Brightline Plus, whether that's a scooter, uh, that's a, uh, you can see there the, the golf cart type um, mobility there on the far left, uh, whether it's a Tesla or a van, uh, we have those available. And those are driven by someone else. So it's not a rental car situation. You actually are booking that, and then they will uh, track when you are getting off your train, and you will meet them and go ahead and um, get in that next vehicle to get to your final destination. So let me ask out of this group, how many of you have ridden Brightline? Okay, well, so this is why I include this video in here. So uh, I'm looking forward to a year and a half from now when we ask this question. I ask this question of every group that I speak to that we're going to see lots of hands raised because Brightline will be right here in Central Florida. Uh, but for all of you, with the exception of Kendall and myself, who have not ridden Brightline, this is going to give you a chance to see uh, what it looks like.
All right, so there you go. So to drill down in some of the numbers, so the Orlando Extension uh, Project is 168 miles extending from West Palm to Orlando International Airport. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, more than 1,300 workers on the job. Uh, some other um, really interesting numbers, 450,000 concrete ties made in Fort Pierce, Florida. If you have noticed at Industry Road in 528, is one of the places where we are storing those, uh, there were a lot there, and we um, we started to uh, chip away uh, at the supply as we've begun to build the rail along 528 uh, in Orange and Brevard County. Uh, 155 railroad crossings, and I'll go into some more detail about that, but that is the number of railroad crossings that we are upgrading between Coco and West Palm Beach. Um, cubic yards of rail embankment filled, so 6 million cubic yards. And if you wonder, well, where is that coming from? We actually have two borrow pits along the project. One is uh, in the Desert Ranch area, south of 528, um, just uh, west of the St. John's River Bridge. Um, and then we have another one that is uh, here in Brevard County, uh, north of 528, east of 95. You may have noticed it because there's a conveyor that goes across 528. We worked in partnership with FDOT to get that approved. And so that conveyor has moved a million cubic yards of rail fill from one side of 528 to the other. If we had not used that conveyor, we would have had to use 67,000 truckloads to be able to get that dirt from one side of the highway to the other. So uh, again, we think of um, vehicles, uh, wear and tear on, um, on the highways, um, gasoline use, hours spent. Um, it, the conveyor is a very efficient uh, use of, um, of moving that dirt. So in our Orlando extension project, uh, we have one structure. Um, it's pretty substantial. It's our vehicle maintenance facility. It's located just south of the airport on 62 acres. And this is really going to be one of the most advanced um, uh, train facilities in the country, certainly in the southeast, being able to service, I believe, uh, 10 trains um, within uh, one night. This is where our trains will come to uh, in between service. And basically, I mean, if we want to look at it, it's a very expensive jiffy loop. It has a drop table. Uh, you can go under the train. They have a 30-ton crane inside, which can lift out the engines of the locomotives. So very impressive. Another opportunity for a tour, if anyone is interested, uh, we are reaching a substantial completion on that shortly. And that is where uh, our train sets will be coming in in just a matter of weeks. So another uh, look at our Orlando station at Orlando International Airport. Uh, if you've noticed the big beautiful building to the south of the airport, that's their intermodal terminal facility, which has the rail, it will also connect to their new Terminal C. We are in the process of building out our station inside. We're at 90% design so far, and we're going to begin construction in February uh, of the build out. Now, we're very proud of the fact that in October we reached substantial completion on what we call Zone 2, which is the three and a half mile corridor between the station and 528 through the airport. And you might be saying, oh, three and a half miles, ah, yeah, that's nothing, right? Just three and a half miles of the project. Well, and we're going through the busiest airport uh, in the United States and really threading the needle between their operations. So this was uh, really a testament to the partnership we have with the Greater Orlando Aviation Authority and the work that we're doing to put a double track all along Jeff Lupe Boulevard. We rebuilt Cargo Road, if you see in the top right corner, we completely rebuilt that interchange. Um, we also um, uh, had to go underneath the taxiway, so you see the Southwest, train, uh, Southwest plane there. We didn't have room to be able to fit under all the taxiways, so in some cases we actually had to build a trench so we could drop the train down and be able to get under those taxiways. All right, so for Brevard County, here's a couple of the glamour shots of all the work that's taking place. Uh, just to kind of explain, the top left corner is the St. John's River Bridge, which is uh, going to be complete in a couple of months. Uh, the bottom left is the uh, underpass that we built at 528 and US 1 in 21 days using a box jacking method uh, that is used around the world. This was only the fifth application of this in the US. We actually had the third application on our project as well. This was the first time, though, that they used this under live traffic. So we did not have to disrupt traffic on 528, with the exception of a couple overnights where we had to reroute just to do some traffic shifts. In the top middle is the arch structure. How many saw this arch structure being built at 528 and 95? I'm trying to figure out what on earth are they doing there? What is going on? 
Well, you can't see it like that anymore because we built, we put the dirt over it. Uh, and so actually, and I'll, I'll have this in another slide, but in uh, just a couple of days, we're going to be doing a traffic shift and eastbound 528 will be going over that arch structure. So you'll see that taking place. In the bottom middle, that is the 95 bridge uh, that we built across I-95. In the top right is one of our crossings, and the bottom right is the Green Creek Bridge in Melbourne. All right, this is the first time this video has ever been seen. I held off sending this to Abby forever because we were working on the last minute details on it. So this is going to give you a look at some of the work that's taking place uh, in what we call Zone 3 along 528. Okay, so we've been a little busy. Uh, so looking uh, from Cocoa to West Palm Beach, so Brevard sits in an interesting location, and the Space Coast sits in an interesting location because not only does it include miles in which we are building a new rail alignment, which goes from Cocoa West to the airport, but we're also building along an existing freight line, the existing rail right of way from Cocoa down to West Palm Beach. And between Cocoa and West Palm Beach, we cross five counties, including Brevard. We have 129 miles of track. I mentioned 155 railroad crossings, 19 bridges, and two structural underpasses. Specifically in Brevard County, going back to the arch structure and the bridges, um, I already mentioned we're going to have the traffic shift taking place. Uh, we'll also have some closures of I-95 as we work to to complete the I-95 bridge that's taking place. So uh, uh, expect to see that um, coming up next week. But getting back into the Cocoa to West Palm Beach, uh, the total railroad crossings in Brevard County, 54. Four of those are in front net. We've completed 34. We're more than 50% of the way there. We have 20 more to go. The bridges, we have six locations and 11 bridges, which my engineers had to, and engineers had explained this to me, we're putting double track, so that counts as two bridges if we're doing double track. So we have completed two of the bridges, those are um, at Horse Creek, um, I'm sorry, Goat Creek, and we have nine more to go. We're currently working on bridges at Horse Creek, O'Galley, Crane, Turkey, and Sebastian. And for those, with the exception of Horse Creek, all those will be double track. So we actually build the trestle, you can see there in the Crane Creek picture on the bottom right, the trestle out, we could then go ahead and um, re, uh, build a bridge, a brand new line. We will then move freight traffic over. We'll then demolish the other side and rebuild that as, uh, that as well. And then once complete, those two tracks will be interoperable between freight and passenger. As you can see here in the top right corner of the crossings, that's an example of the medians that we're putting in place. So on many of the crossings throughout Brevard County and throughout the project, uh, we are preparing those to be quiet zone compatible, uh, whether it's through medians, as you see in the photo, or through quad or exit gates, which will keep people off in vehicles off of the tracks, make it very difficult to go around the gates and to go onto the tracks while they're in service. Here are some additional photos. You can see um, here the median as well as the dynamic envelope, um, the additional striping that's been um, painted to make it very clear 
uh, where vehicles should stop. Uh, and then the quad gates, so quad gates will come together. Uh, if you've been through Central Florida, you've seen um, this where Sunrail crosses, there are quad gates in place there. And basically the two gates come together, you cannot drive around them. In areas where the quad gates are not possible, medians are often used, which make it, again, difficult for vehicles to be able to just drive around the gate without doing significant damage to the vehicle in the process. And finally, I just want to uh, end with this. We had another milestone in October when the first of our five train sets that will be used on the Orlando extension came through Brevard County uh, along the Florida East Coast Rail Line. Uh, so we had some drone footage of it. It just gives you uh, a look at it. Uh, the train was towed by a freight train all the way from Sacramento, California. It took about 10 days. The train is capable of driving uh, along the rail, uh, but the signals are not set up yet uh, all the way from California to here uh, for our train. So they are towed um, by a, a freight locomotive. So this was coming through the Dixon crossing in Coco uh, just a couple of months ago. Yes, Mr. Thank you so much. Mr. Commissioner Wilbur. Katie, um, first relax. I'm not going to raise your blood pressure. <laughs> I raised your blood pressure plenty, I'm sure, on Tuesday evening. That's not my goal today. Um, I'm interested, I'm genuinely interested in the underpass. Um, I'm interested, number one, in hearing a little more in terms of whether there are any concerns about water in that location, and secondarily, um, if you can tell us more, because it sounds like it was somewhat innovative, I'd like to hear about it. Because I, I saw that and I thought, going under something in Florida, if it's cost-effective, great, but you know, normally in my experience, if you go over it, it's oftentimes cheaper. I'm, I'm sure the math was done, I'm sure the engineering was done. Yeah. It, it's just it's so atypical and so different from what I'm used to seeing. I, I just would like to hear more if you have anything that you can provide us. Sure. Are you referring to the arch structure? Is that what you're referring to, or the box yeah, jacket? I think it's, uh, what is it, by uh, 521, or I'm sorry, 528 and 1. In US 1? Yes. So the box jacking uh, underpass, it was, it's a, an alternative technical concept that our contractors brought to us during the bidding process um, to save money and time. Um, and box jacking is, um, is, was started by a company named Petruco out of Italy. Um, they've done thousands, I believe, about 2,000 um, throughout the world in um, the Middle East, Asia, and Europe, where they just don't have the room to do detours if they shut down a road, uh, quite frankly. And so they brought, uh, our contractor, Granite Construction, brought us this idea and said, well, why don't we use box jacking to essentially fill concrete boxes off-site. When I say off-site, I mean just adjacent to where you're going to install them. Rather than shutting down a roadway and building a traditional, when I'm say tunnel or underpass, which would take months to a year, we're going to build the, the boxes off-site, have no impact to the, tr the, the public, to any traffic, and then we're going to jack them into place using hydraulic jacks. So I encourage you to, uh, when, you're, when you walk out of this meeting, Google Petruco box jacking time lapse, and you will see the time lapse of getting these into place. So at Goldenrod Road in 528, we did this in September of 2020. We did it with two boxes, and we jacked them into place in nine days. Is that the one that you said was the third in the US? That was the third in the US, okay. the first in the Southeast. And then in um, April of 21, we finished the project at 528 in US 1 with three boxes that then were jacked into place in 21 days. And we actually had um, an anti-drag system in place, so we were, we were jacking those into place while traffic was still traveling on top. Um, in terms of water, well, in Florida, water can be our nemesis. And so throughout the entire project, it certainly um, drainage and, and working through that has been, uh, has been a challenge. Um, but you know, in, in these cases, that's part of the process that the engineers worked on uh, to be able to do so. Uh, and making sure that once completed, it's obviously going to be something where water is not going to be able to, to pool or cause any significant issues throughout that. The train will travel through uh, what we call the Cocoa Curve at 528 in US 1 at around 65, 70 miles an hour uh, through there, which is critical when we talk about, in terms of high, higher speed rail, is getting from one destination to the next uh, more efficiently and keeping those speeds um, going. Thank you. 
Appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Forrester. I have a couple of questions. Um, and one can sound selfish because it is. What's in it for us? I mean, all we're getting is a new train track coming through the county. Uh, I've heard 300 rumors that uh, they're going to put a station in Rockets. They're going to put a station in Cocoa right before the curve. They're going to put a station somewhere else. They're going to connect to the port. What's in all this for us? So is, so it, I, I certainly understand your question. Let me let me just address the station, the elephant in the room station question. So, uh, and what I can tell you is that it's always been part of our strategic vision to bring a station to the Space Coast. It wasn't on your map. We have to get a train to Orlando first. Why? Okay. Because you can't have a station until you have a train. Okay. Uh, you can get a station to Coco and make it go to Miami and then you can finish to Orlando. But I won't even go to uh, my second question, uh, who owns this company? Where does the money come from? So it's all from private investors. It's owned by uh, Porches Investment Group, and all of our dollars are privately funded. <coughs> all right, I think I'm going to stop for now. <laughs> now yes, yes, Ms. Koss, yes. Hi, Katie. Hi. Um, we have, how many of the crossings, or you call them quad crossings when they have four tracks, how many four tracks are there in the bars? And what is, do you do anything special on those? Because one of them is located close to where I live, mm -hmm. and I know that, you know, we're kind of looking at it with depredation. Sure. Given that, um, well, please tell me. Which, which crossing are you referring to? Uh, the one on Michigan Avenue. That's the only, that's the only four track in Coco. But how many are there throughout the bar, I'm wondering? So are you talking about four tracks or quad gates? Uh, well, there are four sets of tracks. Four sets of tracks, yes. And I believe, um, and I know we had, um, we had an engineer here on Monday for the Technical Advisory Committee, and he was explaining that based on how um, the trains are coming in there uh, in North Coco, um, near 528 US 1, so we're looking at, um, uh, let me see, the front neck and then the area south, which would include Michigan. That is, I believe it's not going to be four, I believe it's three, but the, as he was explaining. It's a wide crossing. It is, it is a wide crossing based on how the trains are going into uh, the Senex area there. Um, and then and some, it's, it's different than if you go further south where you have two tracks and they're, going, they're just passing through. Right, instead of going off into, you have the rock trains coming through. We all know the rock trains that come through. And so there have to be certain tracks that are dedicated to that to be able to keep the additional freight and passenger rail uh, efficiently going through as well. So and, and that is a unique area by having um, the three tracks there in that, uh, in that area. The rest of the corridors too is double track. Are there any unique safety precautions then? Because I mean, I just know that I sure hope that those gates work because I'd never get across if there was something. Sure. You wouldn't see it in time. To sure. Cross. So each of the crossings has been engineered specifically based on those those particular needs of that crossing. Uh, so I don't believe that that is one of the crossings that will have quad gates uh, because the, the speeds that will be going through there will be less than 79 miles an hour. And so when we look at um, the, when they do their analysis in terms of what safety measures are we put in place there, I don't believe quad gates are in that area, um, but we are going to be implementing positive train control. Uh, we're going to be putting in, and I believe Michigan has already done, so um, the dynamic striping, um, new signals, cantilevers, um, all new um, paving, um, new profiles in many cases. We have many where, you know, you go over a track and bottom out your vehicle, we've, we've smoothed that out um, so that it's uh, easier to get across. Um, so there are a number of other safety measures, and I can find out from Michigan for you specifically what, but each one has, uh, it's going to be completely rebuilt to accommodate the additional track. So, and that includes brand new gates and signals and 
and, um, and striking that would identify where exactly um, the, the, the you know, vehicle should stop. And we also work um, with, um, with the traffic lights in the area as well so that that's being coordinated. And I think um, there was someone in the last meeting on Monday who mentioned that the way it's coordinated, they're able to actually you know, go right through on US-1 and not get stuck there if there's a train coming through. So there's different ways that we're going to be coordinating with them to keep the traffic moving. And I'd appreciate any additional sure. details. Absolutely. We've a lot of questions about it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Madam Chair. Yes. Right Mr. Jordan, yes. I know it's trying to miss me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And I voted for you, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I have a couple of questions. <laughs> questions I'm not as pretty as you. Uh, okay, yes. excellent, excellent uh, presentation. But I must admit, in the beginning when you started talking, I wasn't interested in the South. I was only interested in Florida County. Mm -hmm. um, and, but you brought it home, so I really appreciate that. A lot of good information. The first question, of course, is this going to be online or anything where it can be shared? The, the, presentation? the presentation? I can go ahead and share it with, uh, with the Space of CPO yeah. and, and um, they yeah, can go ahead and send it over to you. But I, I, you know, when you asked the question about how many of us have written, yeah. it's kind of hard to write it if we don't have a station here. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but I think we're all interested in it. But you showed a video where the locomotives were bringing in the, uh, the train, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of blowing going on. So my first question was, how often the train's going to be coming through Brevard County? Mm -hmm. uh, is there a set time for them to be blowing their horns, or is this, and why do they blow their horns if you've got the crosses and all of that? Sure. Uh, so I think what you're what you're referring to well two things one how frequently they'll be coming through so our service will be hourly and so we're looking at 15 to 16 round trips so we're looking at 32 trains a day our service runs between say 5:30 5 45 6 a.m. in the morning till 10 10 30 at night um, it is not 24 7 um, as freight is now with regards to the horn so we we are required to sound our horns at every crossing unless it has been deemed a quiet zone. And so in the cases where, and I know that the Space Coast TPO um, is working on coordinating um, moving forward uh, with exploring quiet zones in which horns will not sound, and there will be additional safety measures that then need to be implemented to be able to ensure that it's, it's safe to not sound the horn, because obviously that is um, certainly a safety measure that the, the trains have when they cross the crossings. Okay, the um, one stop that you were talking about, um, one mile, whatever you said, mm -hmm. as far as process of getting to the train station and then when you're at your destination and you would have a mm -hmm. Uber or someone, mm -hmm. but is there going to be accommodations where someone gets off the train and they can go to the rail place to, to uh, rent a car mm -hmm. instead of so I believe, for example, at the airport, that will obviously be an option. Um, in our other stations, for example, in West Palm um, and Miami and Fort Lauderdale, we do have, you know, we certainly have rideshare locations where Lyft and Uber um, can pick up. Um, certainly down in Miami Central, we have the People Mover down there. We have uh, Tri-Rail, so there's, it, you can easily get to another type of transportation to be able to do that. Um, and certainly at OIA, there will be the option for rental cars as well. Um, if, if the Brightline Plus service is not something that w would work for you, Brightline Plus, I believe, is within a three-mile radius of where you're going for your final destination. Yeah, and I think you said in, was it 2019, you said you had about a million mm -hmm. passengers? Mm -hmm. sure. what, what's the cost to a passenger, average cost of a passenger? So, so right now, I do get from West Palm to Miami. Um, so the first thing to know is we have two classes of service. We have Premier and we have Smart. And so when you go to book your ticket, similar to when you're booking on an airline, you can choose where you want to sit on the train, and that's going to dictate what the cost is for your ticket. So our Premier service is the first, the first passenger car of the train. The seats are slightly wider. Some would refer to it as first class. If we refer to that as first class, I would say Smart is business class because they're both very nice. The, one of the primary differences is that Premier has its own lounge in our station that you have to have your ticket to be able to get into, and that's because all of your food and drink, including your alcoholic drinks, are included in your ticket price. And then Smart are the other passenger cars uh, where everything is available for purchase, and you also have lounge, a Smart lounge within the station as well. 
So it really is dynamic pricing in the sense that it depends on where you're sitting, when you're traveling, how far you're going. But I would say between West Palm and Miami, you're looking at a smart ticket somewhere between, say, $20 and $35 one way. It, it could be less, depending on what time you're looking to travel. And then Premier could be anywhere from, say, 25 to 45 depending on, again, when you're looking to travel. Right now, I would say the average to get from Orlando to Miami one way is going to be somewhere around $100. Wow. But again, depending on what type of ticket you purchase and when you're wanting to travel. Okay, I, I hope you didn't take my look like that when it was expensive. I thought it was pretty cheap. Yeah, and it can be less than that. We're offering $10 fares right now if folks want to go ahead and try. Uh, uh, try it out to go from West Palm down to Miami. Uh, but again, when you go on, you can take a look and see, okay, well, this is how much I want to spend, or maybe I want to spend a little bit more, and I just want to have everything at my, you know, at my fingertips, and I don't have to pay for anything else along the way. And, and how much time will it take, on average, as far as going from, say, Miami to the airport, Orlando airport? So it's about three hours and 15 minutes, is what the trip will be. Or on average, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Hold on. Um, Mindy has been trying to say something. Yeah, he, he asked all the questions I asked. Oh, I yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to bring on the whole point is that there's probably nobody in this room that's ever going to have a reason to get on that train. I mean, because if it's three and a half hours, it takes three hours to get to Miami, the way I drive, so, you know, take away traffic, would it make any sense for anyone here to drive an hour to Orlando, get on a train, so then you're talking about a four hour trip? It's just, it's, it's unfortunate. I, I'm bringing on the tones that it would be really nice to have something here for the port and be a priority because you're missing out on a huge amount of money um, for people that are traveling from the space industry to the tourism industry to people that just want to go to Miami to go to our Basel, you know, or mm -hmm. something like that, you yeah. know. So it's, it's unfortunate we don't have one. So I wanted to say when, when I came to work for Brightline, I had not ridden the train. I'm not from South Florida, I live here in Central Florida. And so, I would like to encourage, if you have the opportunity to go down to South Florida and you don't want to deal with the traffic in South Florida, you can drive to West Palm, which you have to drive to anyways. Okay? Get on the train and give it a try. Uh, I left a meeting in our Miami office one day at 5 o'clock on the train, and I was in West Palm by 6.10. If I drive that, I have to leave Miami by 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So. Wow. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Foster, then Ms. Minus, and then we're going to have to move on to the next presentation. Mr. Foster. Um, Mark, sir, I had a friend that just did what you just said. Got on the train in West Palm and went to Miami. He had a great experience. He liked it. I never, I've been on many trains that I can write in right line, but I will just to experience it when I get a chance. But my concern is the, was a traffic study because we got a lot of crossings in Brevard County. So I'm concerned about the safety of, of these crossings. How long, when the train passed these crossings, how long I'm going to be tied up? Uh, how long the traffic is going to be back up? Because we're not, for right now, I don't see any benefit from the residents of Brevard of this train coming through. I see a benefit from the state of Florida, but I don't see a benefit for us. We don't have we don't have a, a station here. It's not promoting from our county. People, unless you're looking out the window and seeing everybody waving at somebody. But I don't see uh, any benefit. All I see is uh, traffic being held up. I might be wrong, but I'm asking, have you done a traffic study? How long the train's going to pass through a crossing? How long the person going to be tied up waiting for that train to go to get to their, their destination? Okay, well, I can tell you we are not the rock train, for sure, okay? And uh, we, when we had that train coming through, um, being brought through uh, from California, the rock train showed up as we were in the process of trying to get video of that, and that's why we ended up down at Dixon with our drone, because it blocked everything uh, at Michigan, all right? So we're not the rock train. Uh, our trains will initially start off at four, uh, we call it six concepts, so it'll be four passenger cars and two locomotives. They pass through uh, in going, uh, depending on the speed, which they're going anywhere from say seven to 10 seconds through a crossing. And so we're not a freight train that's going through at a slow rate of speed and has 20, 30, 40 plus cars that are moving slowly. 
So this is this is more efficient. And so yes, obviously everyone will have to stop to let the train go through, but it will be a quick it will be a quick pass through. Now, in answer to your safety question, so we are already in the process. In fact, we had the um, folks from the city of Melbourne who came down um, to see some of the um, safety efforts that we have in place, and we're going to begin the campaigns up here next year to be able to work with the uh, first responders and our local communities and schools about safety at railroad tracks. Because this is an ongoing uh, matter that needs to be addressed. It, we currently have a freight line that goes through Brevard County. So we certainly will be adding passenger rail to that, but being able to communicate the safety message of staying off the tracks and recognizing that these trains are going to be going faster and we do need to be aware of that. It's going to be part of the campaign that we're starting next year. Thank you. Ms. Minus. Hi, uh, thank you. Ms. Katie, I think this is a very good presentation. I appreciate it. It's very enlightening. Um, you mentioned, and uh, when you asked um, how many in the, the room had um, been on the train or ridden the train, uh, very few, if any, except one um, who had been on the train. And you say, okay, well, I'll come back in a year and a half and ask. Um, do we have to wait a year and a half? Is there any way that Space Coast TPO uh, can get a special tour, if you will, uh, if approved mm -hmm. um, with our SCAT director and whomever else needs to approve it, that we can hop on a SCAT bus and ride down and take the tour and come back. Um, I, I'd like to have a, a moderator in the premier area. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Okay, so if that's possible, um, you know, to entertain that, you know, so that we can get an early tour versus waiting a year and a half. Absolutely, and, and waiting a year and a half, uh, that, that's actually not quite accurate because certainly, you know, the train is operational down in South Florida right now, but certainly if you're interested in doing a tour, we actually have folks who are already booking that out, and you can even book, an, if you have enough people, you can book an entire car just for your, yourselves, and you can have a meeting on the car or not have a meeting and be productive or unproductive, whatever you so choose. <laughs> Uh, so, so uh, yes, it's definitely something that we can do, and, and I think that it would be very beneficial to be able to, to experience it yourself, what it's like uh, to travel. We have nothing like this in the United States. For those of us who've traveled internationally and we've ridden on uh, high-speed rail, we have somewhat of an idea of what it's like, but we were probably in our whole mindset of different language and trying to just navigate uh, a foreign country, but when you hop on this train, it is comfortable. Uh, it's easy. It, you can be productive. We have high-speed Wi-Fi. Or if you don't want to be productive and you want to have a drink, you can do that as well. Um, and it smells good. Um, we have a signature smell in all of our stations and all of our trains, and it's grapefruit. And, um, and you laugh, but I guarantee you, when you walk in that station, you're going to say, I smell that. And you're going to say, what is that? And you're going to remember it's grapefruit. I think that's great. If we can have uh, our chair and your director, you know, we can I'm actually kidding about the margarita. I'll probably have my own. <laughs> but, um, you know, because it would be business. But um, definitely, I, I want to ride. I want to see what it's like instead of waiting a year and a half. Well, we look forward to setting that up. Okay, good. Thank you, Ms. Minus. You took that right, right out of my head. Thank you very much. Any other questions before we move on to the next presentation? All right. Let's yeah. move on. Yes, I Commissioner just, Smith. I just wanted to make a comment. Thank you. I just wanted to make a comment. Having been involved with negotiations and conversations back and forth with Brightline since 2014, um, some of the questions here today were on our minds back then. And one of which was asked by Frank, what's in it for us? Well, to be blunt, it really doesn't matter what's in it for us because they own the tracks, and I'm a property rights guy, and I wasn't a fan of this whole operation from the beginning. But I'm a property rights guy, they own it, they want to put a zillion cars on it, or three, it's their choice. So it's not a question of what's in it for us. And as far as a future station, it's going to happen. But it has to make economic sense, so it's not going to happen until they do the studies, and, and there's enough people that are interested in going. So it, it's going to happen. 
Where it's going to happen, nobody knows, but a good guess is at the bend in Coco. So that will make a lot of people here happy. Uh, never having been on a train, I was on one about three weeks ago when I was in Washington, D.C. I grew up in New Jersey, which is just a short three-hour car drive away. And I thought, well, you know what? When I finish this trip on Friday, maybe I'll go up and visit family. I'll just rent a car for 140 bucks, take that three-hour maniacal trip up 95 that should only take about an hour and a half, but because of traffic, it's a three-hour trip. There's a lot of hassle. And my staff said, Commissioner, why don't you take a train? I never, never gave it a thought. Well, 140 bucks for a car, train was 53. Three hours by car, an hour and 20 minutes by train. So I became a convert. But I can tell you the difference between going to Union Station, what you're showing up there, is like the difference between seeing something in the Jetsons versus the Flintstones. It's, it's way, way different. So I'm looking forward to taking my first trip. And oh, one other thing. <laughs> Uh, you can thank your county commissioners because some questions have been raised here about cost of crossings, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, one county commissioner in particular, Robert Fisher, he negotiated with, uh, on our behalf, back in 2014, um, that Bright Line would put in these pocket zones for us at no charge and maintenance up to eight years at no charge, including the cities. Because originally they had asked, we had negotiated with them and they were going to give us 10 years, I think it was, for uh, the county crossings. And they were going to offer, I think, five or six years for the cities. And we, the commissioners then, decided we didn't accept that because it really wasn't fair. So we compromised and made it eight years. Well, now we've renegotiated with these folks. Now they're going to give us 16 years of maintenance free on these crossings or two cycles, which is going to save you the taxpayers a lot of money yeah. and the fact is they own that crossing many people don't understand that every crossing that we have in this county we're trespassing on their property they give us the permission to cross that so they could just be bad neighbors and say you know what we're not going to let you go across now there's probably some legalities involved there but that's the bottom line so for them to step up and offer those crossings to us free and the boot offer the maintenance, we should be thanking them. Yep. Because it could have cost us a lot, a lot of money to put in those crossings. Thank so you. Just, just some information. Madam Chair, if I may just um, to uh, add on to um, what was just said, uh, just to let the members know what the TPO is planning, the next steps uh, uh, about the uh, safety upgrades at all the crossings. Uh, first of the year, um, back in 2014, there was a resolution that we would take the lead on the quiet zone application process because there is a, a very detailed technical process that you have to go through. And so we are planning to do that. Um, the first of the year, we're going to get um, all the local agencies together um, uh, along with the county and make sure that we're all on the same page and begin that process. The Florida DOT um, uh, District 5 has also agreed to help us with support on that, and uh, they're using uh, their consultant, Hiddleston and Associates, which happens to be our consultant that did that work back in 2014 for us, uh, the, the planning level quite some analysis. So I think we have a plan to move forward and review, you know, what is out there right now via the construction plans at each one of the crossings, but there's an application. You have to file a notice of intent, and, and it's very detailed. So that is, the TPO will head up that process, and, um, and that'll be the next step. So we're looking forward to that. Thank you. Mr. Bugelman. Not to prolong this, but just to follow up on uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Smith's comment, uh, back when I was city attorney of Melbourne, I did a lot of research on the rail crossing uh, for the FEC, and those agreements, many of them go back to the 1920s and 1930s. They're horribly drafted, and uh, they basically uh, throw on the local government uh, all the expense for maintenance. So, uh, as Commissioner Smith noted, with Brightline uh, adding up uh, 
16 years worth of maintenance. What's in it for us? That's one thing right there that's in it for us, and it's it's a big something. And, and I might I might add that uh, there's a lot of counties between here and Miami, and I don't know that any of them got what we got. So we owe them a big thank you. <laughs> thank you. Or you owe commissioners a big thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Katie. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank, thank you so thank very, you much. very much for having me. All right. We'll move on to the last presentation out of the Vieira Company. Master plan update. Ava Ray. I better hurry this up. I'm losing the room. <laughs> thank you, everyone. It's an honor to be here today. Uh, my name is Eva Ray, and I'm the Vice President of Community Management and Communications for the VR Company. Uh, I am here today just to give the TPO kind of an overview of Viera, its master plan, and our infrastructure investment in this county. You know, for 32 years, the VR Company has been building roads and infrastructure, and for all intents and purposes, we're doing what a city does. You know, we're building a city, but um, because we're not a city and we don't have a seat at the TPO, we want to make sure that um, everyone here kind of understands where we are and what we're doing. So, really quickly, just a little bit of history. So, in the 1940s, uh, the Duda family purchased all the property that is Vieira and all the property around Vieira for their Coco Ranch, their family's Coco Ranch, where they raised cattle, uh, recreated a lot of recreation areas for the family, and that was, uh, again, the family's Coco Ranch. But, I-95, was constructed and bifurcated the ranch. So the family started thinking about what that meant for the future of this area. And the family got together and decided that they wanted to build a town, the town of Vieira. So in 1989, that master plan was announced. They started donating land to the county, uh, such as where the uh, county offices are, the school board, um, donated a lot of other uh, county office land in 1990. Our DRI, or Development of Regional Impact, was approved, uh, and 3,200 acres on the east side of Vieira was added to that DRI. We also donated land for the zoo in 1991, where the entire community came together and built the zoo as a volunteer project. Looks like we had somebody who was there helping out. Uh, 1992, Vieira Boulevard was constructed from US 1 to Merrill Road. Uh, the Space Coast Stadium opens in 1993 on donated land. Uh, the VR Company uh, constructs Stadium Parkway in 94. We jumped I-95 in 1995 and added 5,800 acres to our development and regional impact. The VA Clinic and Justice Center opens on, again, VR Company donated land. We started having schools open. We have two elementary schools in, in 2001 to 2003. Uh, Help First announces their plans to open a hospital in VR. And uh, again, the uh, VR company donates land for the VR Regional Park, you know, very central large park right in the middle of Vieira. Then our development of regional impact expands, adding 11,500 acres, and our VR Wilderness Park was approved, and that's our huge conservation area just to the west of here. Uh, 2010, everything else, the balance that was Coco Ranch was added to our master plan. Hospital opens in 2011. The final phase, which is phase four of our development of regional impact, our development order, um, was approved by the county, and that include all of the mitigation for the, for the rest of the transportation impacts to the county. So all of our roads, everything that we have uh, yet to do was included in phase four. And then just this year, VR was ranked in the top 20 best-selling master plan communities in the country. So here's what we look like today. Our population is just a smidge over 29,000. We have over 13,000 homes, about 3.5 million square feet of commercial space. Costco opened this morning, adding another 160,000. Uh, we have about uh, 10,000 uh, jobs, 780 businesses, and our acreage is 20,646. That's what it was yesterday, that's what it is today, that's what it will be tomorrow. We will never get any bigger or any smaller. That is our development of regional impact. Now, what you see here is uh, why you would want to have a master plan in your community. 
and I'm not going to read every bullet point, basically, a master plan is a roadmap to the future. We have about 20, 25 years left to go in our development order. But because you control every aspect of that, uh, you can stabilize home values by the product you offer, you approve all of your builders, you design your open space. Quick question, how much open space do you guys think VR actually has? I mean, we get accused of building over all of our open space. But 46% of VRF is open space, planned open space. So there's a lot of conservation, a lot of preservation, recreation, golf course, stormwater, things like that. But 46% of VRF is open space. Uh, we also can uh, design our communities around live, work, play opportunities, where you can work, where you can go to school, where you can um, eat with your family, shop with your family. We also can provide an elevated, uh, not just design, but say landscaping. I know a lot of people think as they drive through Vieira that the beautiful medians, flowers, trees, might be maintained by the county, but actually that's all Vieira. We maintain all of the right of way and landscaping on the major collector and arterial roadways. It's a smart investment. You can count on it happening. You can, you can count on what the future looks like when you have a master plan. So people easily invest in uh, VR, both residential and for commercial. So what is the development of regional impact? Well, that is a uh, planning term to describe an area that will have an impact on many different areas and extend over multiple counties. But we also use the acronym VRI to describe the boundaries of Viera as well. So as you can see here, the red lines and the green lines, that is at 20,646 acres. So the red line and the green line is the boundaries of Viera. We have very clear geographic boundaries, just as a city would. And um, you see the, internet, the interstate <coughs> running right through it, so clearly it's a little bit more uh, leaning to the west than it is to the east. If you look at the green on the west side, that's the Vieira Wilderness Park. So that's going to be held in conservation and perpetuity. That will never be built on, will never be developed. And it has very clear um, wildlife habitat management plans and mitigation for um, protected species, for trees, for fauna, for all sorts of um, natural Florida wildlife that might be in the Vieira Wilderness Park. This is our uh, master plan. This is actually an exhibit from our development order. Uh, the development order, uh, again, contains all of the um, items that we need to complete, roadways, um, uh, concurrency for education, for transportation. Uh, it also includes all of the zoning we're gonna need and our, our PUDs for the future. Um, and it also includes uh, the caveat that other jurisdictions have to approve our DRI as well. So we do have the county, we have the state, uh, other planning organizations also have to sign off on this DRI so that we can ensure that that concurrency happens across many different disciplines. All right, entitlements. This is one of my favorite subjects. Uh, whenever I you see something on Facebook where, oh, they're building another apartment building, oh my goodness. Well, um, entitlements are the categories of things that we build that are included in our development order. And these are set forth in our development order. We can't go over them. Uh, we can't decide that we want, instead of 31,000 homes, we want to build 40,000 homes. You can't do that. You have a set number of entitlements, and that is um, what we are currently executing. So those are your rights and restrictions that are given through a land use amendment, zoning, site plan, planning approval, et cetera. So those are the things that we can build within the era. So an example of some types of entitlements, residential units, single and multifamily uh, residential, office, hospital, health clinics, ACLF and nursing homes, Industrial distribution, warehousing, wholesaling, retail, hotel or motel, attractions and recreation facilities, and golf courses. So within our development order, the number or square foot of these units are spelled out. 
But that is, that is what the year will be in the future. This is kind of what it looks like. This is a quick summary. So in about 20, 25 years at build out, the Earth's population will be just a, probably a smidge over 70,000, about 31,000 homes, about 7 million square feet of commercial space, about 25,000 jobs, about 1,000 businesses, and again, 20,646 acres. Now, let's talk about some uh, investment. What sort of investments has the VR company made in Sierra? Again, we've been building roads for about 32 years. These numbers and these charts represent just collector and arterial roadways. It does not include all of the neighborhood roadways or any um, shared drives or anything along those lines. So in the pink is the completed roadways. That's about $188 million there. Yellow is completed intersections, about 84 million. And uh, future projects is currently a little over $7 million investment. You can see here just a breakdown of those particular projects. Uh, the new Pinea Causeway extension that was just completed and opened, uh, you know, $23 million. Uh, this, our stadium parkway improvements, uh, that's about um, oh, $42 million. Uh, so you can see the investment that we've made over time on our collector and arterial roadways. Our, um, some of our other infrastructure that is not uh, roadways, such as our intersections. And this could also include funding requirements and not actual construction. For instance, we had a funding requirement contribution for Barnes uh, Boulevard when it was uh, improved. So you can see here we have our interchanges, traffic signals, intersections, roundabouts, park and ride lot that we um, also operate in Viera. And then our future investments. Uh, one commonly asked question is a spyglass flyover. You can see that is in our future plan. Uh, when this comes to fruition, uh, the Washingtonia Boulevard extension. And we'll have a lot of westward improvements that we need to make once we go west of Powerline Road. So Judge Grant Jameson, Wickham, uh, Vieira Boulevard, uh, those sorts of roadways. So currently we're planning about $85 million investment for these future extensions. One thing to remember that our investment, uh, these numbers here do not include any of the right way related improvements either. You know, landscaping, irrigation, monument signs, uh, traffic lights, signage, media improvements. Uh, the numbers I gave you were just pure roadway numbers. Again, some of our uh, future projects that people are uh, pretty interested in and seeing come to fruition is Spyglass, Washingtonia, uh, Stadium Parkway, Vieira Boulevard, Judge Free, and uh, Wickham Road. Uh, we've got some more Pinita Causeway work to do. We're doing it now, it's under construction. So Pinita Causeway is scheduled to be completed fully all the way from Wickham around over to I-95 about mid-2022, so July-August time frame. And that's it. I tried to go quickly. I know we all want to go home, uh, but I'll entertain any questions that anybody might have. Any questions for Ms. Ray regarding this project? Yes, Mr. Gordon. Yeah, just, just one. I, I was looking at your entitlements, but how do these schools on? Well, schools are the responsibility of the Brevard Public Schools, but we have committed, we have an uh, agreement with Brevard County Schools to provide the land that they would need for any future schools. I know you had the hospital. Cool. That's private, right? That is private. So how is that entitlement? How is a hospital entitlement? The hospital beds are. They're counted per bed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You were prepared. Mm -hmm. I do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from Ms. Ray regarding this presentation? I just, like I did on Monday, want to publicly thank um, Eva and the Vieira Corporation. They've been a great traffic safety partner. Not only were they part of our vision to the planning process, but I know Eva does traffic safety when they have a new resident orientation and talks about you know, the, the features in your area and the safety and legal aspects of um, those things. So we appreciate that. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Kim. And I would add, uh, they've been a great transportation partner as well. So we do appreciate very much what you've brought to the community. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much for a great presentation. I'd like to say that they make my job easier. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, we will not have a meeting in January. Oh, Mr. Vogelman, I, I, I saw your reaction when we mentioned having a meeting on the train, a public meeting on the private train. Are we good now? I don't think we'll have a meeting there, but. Oh, okay, I, was nice. I thought that was an excellent idea. Can we um, coordinate that through staff, the tour, perhaps? We can have everyone get. Absolutely. Um, so, Mr. Vogelman, as far as sunshine, And then if any of us here would like to have our fellow councilmen from our city attend and go on that um, tour as well, can we also um, go on the same tour? All right, I know we've lost quite a few of them, but they might be interested we in that. We will definitely them. reach out to all the members. Okay, yes. all right, that would be great. All right, so we do not have a meeting in January, as I just said. I'm sorry, did you want to say something, Mr. Jordan? I said you just said yay. Oh, okay, I did not want to, want to ignore Mr. Jordan. Um, the next meeting will be February 10th. And look for member orientation registration coming up on January 19th. And thank you very much for um, keeping me as your chair for the next year. I am looking forward to it. I'm honored and humbled to sit here. Anything good for the good of the order? Anyone want to make a comment? And Merry Christmas. Thank you. Merry Christmas and happy holidays to everyone else. And a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second? Second. Lost the quorum. Lost Oh, okay. Sorry. We are adjourned. Thank you. Okay.